Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Hey everyone, and welcome to All Together, the Family Science Insights Podcast, produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm your host, Dina Sargent. Now, let's get started. Family functioning. What is it? How can we tell the differences in functioning and know what we need to improve? To help us make these distinctions is our guest of the day, Ashley Chapman. How are you going today, Ashley? I'm really well, thank you. How are you? I'm really good. It's really cold here today and very rainy. So um, yeah, it's it's been a journey today already. <laughs> oh, of course, of course. And I must apologize for any background noise. I do have two Kelpies in the back there. So they may join in at some stage. <laughs> oh, we love that. We love when they come in, trust me. <laughs> um, so do you mind telling um, the audience a little bit about yourself and how you've managed to get into this topic as well? Yeah, sure. So um, I actually started my mental health career working with children with autism um, in applied behaviour analysis. So I was working in homes with young children um, and working on daily living skills and behaviours and things like that. And I really struggled with, um, I guess, how individualised the therapy was. Um, And so I had found functional family therapy um, and the rest is history. I sort of had it applied. Um, I was working as a therapist there and, and now I work as a team leader in our New South Wales office running functional family therapy for adolescent violence in the home. Um, I guess my study background, I've everyone knows me, who knows me well, knows I'm such a student. So I've been studying for <laughs> ever since I left school. So I started off in a Bachelor of Psych Sciences um, I then I had some personal things happening with me at the time and so I wasn't able to continue psych so I decided to do a graduate diploma in autism studies and then a graduate diploma in health science and research um, and then I came back and did my master's in counselling and psychotherapy um, so I'm a registered counsellor now and now I'm actually going back online to finish off my psych studies um, and in the midst of all that I've just had a beautiful baby girl so (laughs) I've been a little bit busy (laughs) oh wow congratulations on that by the way thank you thank you (laughs) it honestly sounds like you've um had such an amazing journey when learning about what you wanted to do and having all these different um achievements under your belt as well throughout all that time yeah yeah I mean in psych there's such a broad range of things that you can do so (laughs) I'm really fortunate to have found I guess a niche in what I really like yeah, that's amazing, especially now, especially after COVID and things, having all those things that's really helpful to talk about. And now that the conversations are coming up a little bit more than it was a few years ago as well, I think it's a perfect time to get into this. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. So before we start and get a little bit more into the topic today, we love to start with a little icebreaker on five different things and different genres that Um, just to see how your mind is and just for everyone to sort of know a little bit more about you without asking the questions about who you are. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) All right. So the first thing is one of your favorite books. Uh, My favorite book is actually um, one I've read recently is The Boy Who Who Was Raised as a Dog by Dr. Bruce Perry. Um, I just really love that book. It really I, I click with everything in that book and it's quite an easy read as well. It's nice to clinically look at something without having to be reading a textbook as such. That's really, that's a really cool one, actually. Um, how about your favourite movie? Um, it's going to sound really cliche, but I honestly don't have one favourite movie, but my favourite movies <laughs> um, is anything Marvel. I am an absolute Marvel 
nerd. <laughs> like, I love them. Um, so we actually just recently saw the new Doctor Strange as well. I oh, know that's always my favorite genre. It's a genre in itself. It's it not is. anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How about your favorite podcast? Um, I've actually got two, if that's okay. Yep, <laughs> My for first it. one would have to be um, Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. And I feel like, you know, it can be so cliche amongst, you know, women in, in psychology and counselling, but she is amazing and I could listen to her all day. And then the second one would be um, The Where Should We Begin by Esther Perel. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard any of her talkings or podcasts. It, she's fantastic and the way that she conceptualises relationships is really fascinating and Again, she just has one of these voices you can listen to all day. <laughs> well, I'll definitely have to look her her up. I've heard of Brene Brown, but not um, the other person. So it'll be really yeah, Estee Pro. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's definitely on my list to do for the rest of the day now. <laughs> um, how about one of your famous role models? Um, that one's really dependent on like what aspect of my life you're sort of looking at. <laughs> um, but right now, I guess. Uh, motherhood is a focus for me and so Jana Pittman is someone I really look up to so she's an Australian Olympic sprinter um, and she just encapsulates motherhood athleticism and her career as well and um, I really look up to that and admire that. Wow okay yeah that's really good. Um, How about a famous course a popular course that you've completed? Uh, So just before I went on maternity leave, I was really fortunate to be able to complete the Gottman uh, training in couples therapy as well, which is really cool. Okay, wow. That's that's an amazing achievement. Another thing under your belt now as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a few. <laughs> okay, so going into talking about family functioning now, I know that there's a lot of different definitions and it's not like one set definition as to what it is because everyone has their little perspective Mm. as to what it is but how would you personally define family functioning Uh, again I guess it just depends on the aspects of family we're sort of talking about like there's we no longer have the nuclear family of mom dad brother sister I mean family can be whoever you want it to be um In our family, we have what we call family, which are friends who become family. Um, And, you know, family functioning is within that too. What what I see is functioning, someone else doesn't. Or what I see is functional, someone else doesn't. Um, And vice versa. So I guess it depends on what aspects of family we're talking. So if we're talking about direct biological families, you know, mum, dad, siblings, grandparents, cousins, etc. You know, I think as a general rule, we're really looking at who's close to you and who do you feel safe with? Um, and who do you personally see as your family and who do you want in your your direct family to have contact with as well? So I think it just comes down to every individual's perspective on that. Um, mm-hmm. For me personally, I have a big range of family. Um, and I think when we talk about family functioning, it can be really different, difficult, sorry, to look at that as a, as a holistic picture, because within the family, we have different dyads and different relationships with different parts of those roles as well. Um, so again, quite, quite individual. So I hope that sort of answers your question. (laughs) No, it does. I think it opens a big question and big need for discussion on that further as well I really like the um the phrase family yeah <laughs> become family like when I heard that I was like yeah that's a big definition that should be something that is that catches on with a lot of people because <laughs> I think for a lot of friends do become a lot more um of family members when they spend so much time with everyone I know I've got a couple of friends who I would consider family more than um more than everyone else that I have around me as well. So yeah, it does sort of um, have that sort of function in that. Uh, you were talking just then about the picture, picture looking different. For example, like it's not just mother, daughter, father, son kind of relationships anymore. And mm. so how would you sort of see it now? And what sort of family roles does it take, does it entail? 
it like in terms of how um how those rules look roles look now for families yeah yeah Yeah, look I think that roles they are important to play but they aren't really held in such high esteem now so so people within the family functioning aren't um just trying to please certain roles within the families and and each role has um a different payoff for a person so I guess I think of it in terms of like the perspective of a young person in the family so um a a son or a daughter in terms of their relationships with their parents and and keep going up that hierarchy there and I think that every every role has its part to play but I feel that we are much more on an equilibrium to one another as well so it's this loyalty that comes for families is really something that is earned rather than given because you have a certain role. So just because you are mom, that doesn't mean you have all of this respect in the world from a young person anymore. It's it's really, it's a dyad that needs to be shared and cared for and respected between each other rather than just, I wear this hat and so therefore I play this part and therefore you would treat me this way. Um, we've really moved away from that especially in you know our western cultures as well so why do you think that is because i know like a lot of a lot of it's changed has a lot of it changed because of the mental awareness that people are going into now or does that have no kind of impact on it i think where it actually comes from is a bit of ego to (laughs) be honest um so what we do see, and this is going to sound really harsh, is a lot of that egotistical parenting <laughs> where okay. um, parents are sort of stepping into a space of demanding a certain level of respect because that's how it's been done. That's, you know, that's how I was raised. You you just automatically had respect for this person because of their title. And I think it's really peeing people off <laughs> um, and young people are sort of questioning that now. So I think there's much there's a bit of a safety network to question the status quo um, and you see that amongst a lot of things, not just families and positions. Um, but I think it's, yeah, more people questioning the status quo to go, hang on a minute, you know, this is this is a two-way street here in this relationship no matter the role. Mm-hmm. Um, and you do hear a lot of, um, you know, we, we do have more blended families now in terms of when families are divorced and separated and we have that blend of, of new family. Um and then again, that respect is earned, not not given per se. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think within that, you have this, like I said before, that that equilibrium. So we're we're moving to these modern eras of families where we're stepping out of the status quo and stepping out of the rules to go. This is this because of this. It's like, well, why? Why do we need to do that? I think also transgenerational trauma has a massive impact on that too. So. When we're looking at generational trauma, people are stepping away from that. They no longer want to parent how their parents parented because actually that had an impact on me. Um, mm-hmm. You know, they, my, my parent wasn't as present for me. So I'm going to step out of that and step into something else, a new narrative of parenting. I'm not going to accept that that's how we parent. Um, and a lot of things come into play with that too, especially with social media. Um, mm-hmm. I see that myself as as a new mum. I can even get caught up in social media going, oh, okay, this is what we should be doing. This is how we should parent and things like that. And there's a lot of people having a lot of opinions on what what we should be doing. Um, and so that opens a wider conversation, really. And how would that affect families? Like having that, the known to be different roles and the different roles that even a child would take on what a parenting role, for example, and with their younger siblings and how does that affect the family picture in a way? That's a really good question. I guess it really impacts that through the function of why we're stepping into those roles. So when you talk about the children stepping into um, parent roles or being parentified, as we would like to say, um, a lot of that, you know, when we dig deeper, that's that's really coming from a trauma response and a safety response from that child. Um, they're fulfilling a void that hasn't been, um, you know, that something that the parent is lacking in or stepping away from. And it really just comes down to 
safety. Um, so children step into these roles to maintain the status quo of the family functioning. And if that status quo is upheaval and and arguments and really hated times amongst them, they will step into that and elevate that to maintain it. Um, or we could retreat to maintain a sense of silence as well because that's how that's how we get along best. That's how we move forward best. Um, so children are really intuitive in terms of what's going on and they will inadvertently step into those roles to, to maintain that status quo. Mm-hmm. Does that play, I mean, that probably would play a huge role in the intergenerational trauma as well. Yeah. Like you are how your parent, how do you sort of step out of that I don't want to parent how my parent would parent because I know that it's like you sort of do end up parenting the way that your parent parented you when you were younger and like how would you step out of that if you were to? Yeah I guess there's something that we're always on a journey on anyway and I think you don't really notice until it pops up for you until something raises its ugly head we go, oh gosh that was you know, that was like that. And I really didn't want to be that person. But it really is about being present to notice those times and catch those times so then you can look at it and reflect on it and do something differently. If we're not aware of it, there's nothing we can do about it. So the first the first step is really being quite present in your parenting and how you show up with other people in your family to know when those things are happening for you. Um, and only then can you take a step back, reassess and think about, okay, how do I want to do this? How do I want to approach this differently? Um, And that would look very different for very different people. But again, sometimes it's really not until you're in the moment and it's happening. Um, Or even maybe it takes that comment from your partner that you really don't like (laughs) to really go, okay, (laughs) right. Um, But the the essence, it really just comes down to being quite present. So in your sort of the work that you've been doing recently, how would a functional family look like in like an ideal picture kind of perspective? Um, I think like I I do think on this, you know, like what does a functional family look like? And it, it feels we get that question when we step into families and they're like, you know, what are we going to look like at the end of this? Like, how how should we how should we look? And people think of that perfect Brady Bunch style, happy go la family. Um, but I think a fam like I think personally speaking, and speaking from what I've seen, I would say a functioning family is one that feels safe, one that can repair and move forward without ambivalence, um, and one that doesn't sweat the small stuff. You know, because you're going to argue. Uh, that's totally okay. You're human. You're totally going to argue, but do it a little better, you know. <laughs> Repair from it. Don't hold grudges. Um, and one that can, I guess, make decisions and problem solve and maintain the relationships with each other, no matter what that looks like. Um, and again, like just really highlighting safety. So a functioning family is safe emotionally and physically first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Okay. So with, there's like a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of characteristics when it comes to what a family should look like. Yeah. How, how would you, I know like support and love and having that security that you were just talking about, what are the like negatives if one of them isn't sort of one person in the family isn't sort of playing that role that um, can create that kind of that kind of security in a family. Yeah, so I guess the first thing that comes to mind, again from from my background, is when a parent isn't um, stepping into that, and then often, like we like what we spoke before, a child sort of steps into that. But I guess when we started and you had asked me what does a family look like and what does that mean and and i mentioned family normally you'll find someone else to step into that position so if you're not getting your needs met from 
mum as such and there's there's other people around you there's a village around you you know auntie may meet that need for you um or grandma might meet that need for you as a young person and so it's really important that family is extended because it takes a village it really does um and that way you know when we when we step outside of a nuclear family mum dad two children kind of thing and and we open the doors to what family looks like when a need isn't being met from one relationship we can seek it in another and that's perfectly okay it is perfectly Mm -hmm. fine um because our need is still being met by someone who we're attached to and we love and care for I hope I hope that sort of makes sense a bit (laughs) yeah I think um but will it sort of in a way negatively impact a child, for example, like in you're talking about, you find it in someone else. Mm-hmm. When you sort of find it in a relationship, like from indirect experience, I've sort of seen how this how this has happened, and just with like how you don't get your needs met by a parent or by person in your family. Um, for example, a father, you go look into. Re- for a re- in that in a relationship and that can sort of end up with a lot of um negative expectations on what a relationship should involve for yeah. example yeah yeah for sure that absolutely absolutely can happen which again it's so important that young people have just more access to the other adults and other family members um so then you know it's less likely to be sought socially further on down the track um you know they we we can have all of our needs met as children um definitely we have seen where even in young people earlier on before they are finding relationships it's um finding it online as well which is really scary um you know finding that validation love and support for what they feel is love and support um through an online context through social media and that can be really dangerous as well Mm-hmm. So what well, we're like talking about um sort of the dysfunction in a family. Um parent like there's roles, there are different kinds of roles, sort of like the hero and the peacemaker, the the lost child, the person who ends up being the clown to sort of overcompensate what they haven't been getting in a mm. family. Mm. Um what exactly what are exactly these roles and how or in what situation would they be activated, for example? Yeah, so first and foremost, these roles play an important part in keeping people safe. And again, I spoke before about the status quo. Um, so children adapt to their environment. So you spoke before about you know, the lost child who retreats and, and stays quiet to maintain safety. Um, we have, you know, the, the delinquent type of child who, um, you know, is quite an extrovert in terms of how they behaviorally and emotionally manage what's happening in the family unit. Um, they're sort of looking towards connection with social peers and that's not always the best. Um, often they're, they're engaging in not great behaviors out in community. Uh, and that can even be drawing back in their family or as a, as a resistance against family as well. Um, and then we also have the peacemaker and that's often the child that people um, label as parentified because they're normally sort of stepping in and managing relationships and managing the emotions of others and that one can be you know quite damaging for a child who has to grow up a little bit earlier than expected and, and mature earlier than expected to meet the needs of the family um, that's a really difficult one but children adapt to their environment. So they develop these roles inadvertently um, to keep everyone safe. Um, And to some extent, these roles can be beneficial, but like anything in small doses. Um, So, you know, it's always fun to have the, you know, the funny kid in the group or the funny kid in the family, but to what extent um, Mm -hmm. are we looking at and, and how much is that impacting their personal development and their relationships and, you know, is it, is it something that we're all grounding in and, oh, you know, Johnny, he's the funny one, we love him for it, blah, 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 or is it that he's being a pest 
now because mm-hmm. he's, he's always joking around and things like that. But these are definitely characters that I've seen many times over in the work that we do as a response to trauma and domestic and family violence. Um, and many would argue that these children have been parentified. They're looking to bring attention to the abuse, um, which is definitely something that does happen. However, I really believe that these children engage in these characters and roles that they, they are looking to maintain the status quo because that's what they're used to. If they're, they're if the family are used to functioning at a really um, heated level and arguing all the time, people will step into a role to keep it that way. Um, so when we're doing family work and we're sort of trying to, you know, reduce that level of conflict, we will always find that one person who will bat against us to try and cause more conflict because it's uncomfortable not to fight because that's what we're used to. Um, so really these roles are there to bring baseline to the functioning in order to maintain that predictability and safety for those relationships. So how would you notice, for example, like you see a child who you're talking about the clown or the person who's overcompensating Mm. or trauma, how would you notice the difference between, okay, he's, just having fun okay or there's actually something going on that he's trying to hide himself away from yeah so what we um generally work with is what's the function of that behavior so when johnny engages in that behavior what's the response he's eliciting from other people are people being drawn in or are they being pushed away so that's the first and foremost and then we're sort of looking at at what environments is it sort of happening um, and what's the context of that humour as well? You know, when we do are talking about trauma, we do, um, you know, sometimes it might be a primary school kid um, making quite sexualised jokes, things like that, that aren't quite age appropriate where teachers are leaning in going, oh, okay, maybe is there something happening here because that's quite a intense sense of humour that, that this kid has. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things that we would sort of look at to see, okay, where are we bridging that line? Um, but it's not any one of us that gets to decide what that line is. It's definitely a community type response. And it's about what response are we eliciting from the family to, um, in terms of those relationships. So again, are people being drawn in when, when those behaviours arise or are they being pushed away? Um, what's that payoff? for that young person engaging in those behaviours. So it really is assessment sort of based, but that's what we would be looking at. Okay, so what are some sort of common mistakes or misconceptions that you sort of receive about family functioning? Um, So first and foremost, uh, that, you know, a functioning family is one that is happy all of the time. Um, one that where, you know, everyone just wants to spend every waking minute of the day with each other and you'll sacrifice everything and put it all online just for family. Um, I think that's probably like the biggest one. And also that, you know, we have to walk away from every fight and, you know, just walk away when you're angry or that we have to really sit down and talk it out and, um, have these really heavy chats and be deeply emotional with one another in order for things to work. Um, But definitely that, you know, there's this misconception that a functioning family is one that is just happy all of the time. No, I think that's really good because like from every other guest that I've sort of gotten and um, previously to this, sort of in the same kind of answers when it comes to misconceptions, like they're, everyone sort of has the, you have to be happy, you have to sort of Mm. um, play the role of being a parent, whereas like, like, you look at it and parents are still growing as well, that they're still sort of understanding who they are. There's no way that they're going to know or be happy 100% of the time when they're still human first. Yeah, yeah, of course. And I think I said this earlier that you know, par- before we're parents, we're partners. Um, and I think a lot of parents lose that partnership as well because, you know, in order, again, in order to be this fully functioning family I have to be the best parent possible Um, and that's the only role I can play and then we look at okay to be the best parent possible I need to be the best version of myself possible 
but then we forget that there's this in between of this partnership that you have with this person as well um which was the foundation for for the family in the first place so there's a couple of roles there but there's definitely a lot of shoulds that follow follow with those roles you know I should be the best mom and most present mom um you know I shouldn't have a career I should only want to be with my children um things like that and you know for dads you know I should be working but actually I want to be at home with my children um so there is a definitely like a push and pull through that and you know we were discussing earlier that maybe this online space is going to be really cool for parents to be able to be a lot more present in the way that they want to be but also have their careers as mm -hmm. well um and again just challenging that status quo on like what is a functioning family how, how accepting is has society been to the whole role shift that's been going on for example like the mother goes out to work and the the father stays at home like is that still something that's a huge struggle for people to sort of accept as the new normal or is it something that everyone is willing to sort of see yeah I think people are willing to willing to see it I think they're still quite shocked though when it when it does happen I can give you an absolute classic example when um my partner was applying for his paternity leave so um dads get the two weeks off um, paternity leave government funded and he applied for an extra two weeks um, so he wanted to take the whole month of our due date off um, and his work response was very much so why you know they're, they're very male dominated um, workspace now you know why is why do you need to why does she need you that long is everything okay and he's like no no I just want to be at home with my newborn baby and my fiance I don't I don't want to rush. I don't want to have two weeks and then come back. Like I want to be there for that time. And mm -hmm. um, even amongst some of our friends, it was, oh, oh, okay, right, that's cool. But wow, okay. It was, it's just seen as this quite shocking movement that a father would want to be at home with mm -hmm. his baby as opposed to be at work. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think people, like I said, are willing, but it's still quite a shocking, shocking thing for them. Um and it, it is interesting and it, it, I think it's something that, you know, we all know is there, but, you know, you see dad pushing the pram down the supermarket and everyone's, you know, all but kissing his feet about how amazing father he is. <laughs> but, you know, mum does it and no one blinks an eye because she should be doing that. But if dad's doing it, it's, wow, he's stepping into this space, how amazing. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's often something we've discussed about who would actually go back to work in, in our partnership and I'm really fortunate that my partner you know he wants to have that relationship with our children and he wants to be present and so um you know we we just balance that with each other there's no pressure for him to go I have to go back to work because I'm the man of the house and you need to stay at home because you're the mom like he knows I've studied for the last 10 years for my career so he knows I'm very career oriented as well and create space for me to be able to step into that and be a good mom at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it is a really interesting space. Um, I think what also can drive that is that women are a lot more educated now. And so we, for, for some families, women are earning more money. So sometimes it comes down to who actually needs to go back to work um, because financially we need, we need that person to go to go back or maybe that person has better work-life balance um, and so that person will go and the other person will stay at home. So, yeah, it's a really interesting space to to stay tuned to. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting how much, like, we talk about women working and women, but when it comes to the actual functioning of how women go back to work, the, you always get asked, like, oh, so how are you going to go when – when you have kids, you can't work all the time when you have kids. And yeah. I mean, I'm um, like, I'm single by myself at the moment. I still get questions like, okay, what are you going to do when your husband, and when you're married and when your husband goes to work, like, are you going to work too? And I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, well, I'm only like 24 for one. And then I'm also <laughs> like, um, I'm going to be working just as much as they're going to be working. Like, I'm not even there yet and they're still having that 
those questions to me and I'm just like sometimes I sit there and I'm just like wow it's I think it's also in a way the generation that's asking those questions yeah and like the older generation for example it's always my grandparents that are asking so how are you (laughs) going to do that later on and I'm like yeah but I'm I'm still I'm still like this is it's very different to how like in this society you wouldn't ask usually you would usually wouldn't ask those questions just because it's like we yeah. know that it's something that's mentally challenging for a lot of people to sort of handle the answer to. Mm. But mm. I think it's the boundaries that still haven't been seen by the older generation that's it's definitely adding that pressure onto um, family members. Does that have, like, the intergeneration that sort of live in one house, for example, mm. does that sort of have a big impact on how a family functions? Yeah, for sure, definitely. And I, th- I personally, I think it's great. I think it's absolutely great. I think um, we need those different levels and different perceptions, right? Like we need <laughs> different um, different opinions on what we're doing. You know, grandma's opinion is going to be very different to mum's opinion on, on some of our behaviours. And I think we need that. We really... You know, those generations have things to offer and I don't, I don't think we should be silenced and go, they're the old ways because at some point the old ways were functional, right? Like in, in their mindset, you know, obviously we have that um, age-old question about, you know, smacking children. We know that's not functional. But in, in that time, in that moment, it was functional. Mm-hmm. Um, we know that now it's not. <laughs> but it's, it's just good to have those different perceptions um, because that's what's going to keep us grounded. You know, we can't lose those voices either, even though we don't always agree with them, um, even though you know, they're not offering the best advice all the time. We, we still need that, that voice in the room. So I, th- I think it's really cool. I think where um, it definitely does cause dysfunction, though, you know, we do definitely see a lot of arguments because where it goes wrong is the lack of empathy and understanding for one another. Um, so instead of having a level of acceptance to go, okay, I can accept that you that is your opinion and it's different to mine and we're okay still. That's all right. We can disagree. Because it's family, we will attack. We will absolutely attack and go, no, that's wrong. That's wrong. You have to think of this my way because you are my family. Therefore, we must be aligned. But we can still disagree and maintain a really beautiful, loving relationship and that's totally fine absolutely fine but that's where we go wrong is is we don't see that as fine like I said there must be this loyalty and you must align to what I'm saying because we are family we are in this together um we can't be separate people within this unit we must all be one um and I think that's where yeah that older generation it can it can cause a little bit of dysfunction there because that is the mindset of some older generations or even different cultures as well when people are trying to step a little bit away from that you know there's there's a lack of like that dichotomy you know we we can be family um and loyal and loving but also disagree and have Mm -hmm. different values so it definitely sort of fits into the next question so what are some challenges that sort of come in um that create such a dysfunction and I mean other than the ones you spoke about could it also be like the different parenting styles between generations that definitely plays a role in it as well? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you definitely will, you know, get grandma, grandpa saying, you know, oh, I used to do this and you guys turned out fine and blah, blah, blah. Like all, we've all heard it. We've <laughs> yeah. absolutely all heard it. Um, or even, you know, something that I've sort of experienced through, you know, with my baby is, couple of those older generations saying like well, why are they sleeping on their back you meant to sleep them on their on their tummy <laughs> you know just things like that and um it's just the way we disagree like you know like I said we can we can definitely fight or argue just just do it a little better do it so someone doesn't get hurt at the end <laughs> of it um so yeah we definitely have those narrative challenges in families about what should be and shouldn't be and how things should be done um, I guess some of the other challenges that contribute to the family dysfunction are definitely like socioeconomic challenges for families um, and, and outer pressures um, on families, health challenges, 
within families as well you know so someone might be prioritizing their health in a family and someone else might not be and there's disagreement and lack of understanding there um and yet narratives on what parenting should look like um and how it should be done Mm -hmm. and definitely i think the last one would probably be ego um our egos that we bring into relationships have a massive impact on how we can show up for those relationships and how functional they can be. So in contrast, how would you sort of um, recommend family members improve the way that they function? I'm going to sound so cliche. (laughs) It really just comes down to communication. So I actually stole this from a colleague um this saying of connect before you correct um and what we're looking at is is disarming people (laughs) so you you can't keep engaging in a fight with someone we're not getting anywhere once our lids are flipped there's there's no learning there's no negotiation there's very little love and support and there's just absolute ambivalence and, and attacking um but if if we can just connect with each other before we then have that discussion of hey I disagree with you and this is why then we're gonna we're gonna disarm someone you know we're we're not gonna go in to bat so communication first and foremost that and the way that we would do that is is just validation just step into their shoes for two seconds you know that I'm hearing you I understand that's really difficult for you here's my thing here's my opinion about it but disarm them first, get that person into a space where they're willing to listen to what your opinion might be. So, so say if it is, you know, a grandma and she's, like I said, she's saying, you know, you sleep, sleep baby on their front. Why are you sleeping them on their back? Oh, they're so spoiled or don't hold baby all the time. You'll spoil them and, and things like that. You know, just validate, you know, oh, I get that that works for you, grandma. That's really cool. Thanks for that advice, but this is what we're going to do you know, completely disarm someone. They can't come back at you when, they've, when you're validating, <laughs> when you're yeah. validating them and when you've heard them. For sure. Um, so going to talk about practices and habits that involve um, family functioning, what are some of your personal practices that you do to sort of deal with um, how you would function with your family? Something yeah, so something that we do, I guess, in two aspects of our family um, is the traditions. So we have little family traditions which builds up our good tickets and our positive experiences of one another. So then the big stuff doesn't seem so big, you know. Um, we have a lot of positivity, it sounds very fluffy, <laughs> to sort of ground us a little bit. So the, the traditions I'm talking about is... Um, For example, I spoke about parents or partners before their parents. Um, So something that's really important for my partner and I is that once a week we we do Wednesday nights, we we have a date night. And it's not the cliche, we go out for dinner, we go to the movies, things like that. Our date night just involves us being present with one another (laughs) because, you know, Monday through to Friday, it's home from work, dinner's on, all the stuff above, bed right like there's there's no connection there's just routine and your robotic movements going through that routine but on Wednesday nights we slow it down and we just are absolutely present so we don't really have screen time we don't really um go on our phones things like that we just try to be there for one another we might get takeout that night um or we might you know, if we're feeling really socially spent or emotionally spent from the day, we might just watch a movie together in silence and that's okay (laughs) as well. Um, In terms of the broader picture for our family traditions, we do Pancake Sunday every Sunday. Um, And that's sort of, you know, my dad and my stepmom and my brother and sister, um, they had sort of started that. And I guess how it's helpful is it gives you something, it gives grounding to the family this is what we do it gives identity you know something to always fall back on we do pancakes Sunday. that is our thing as a family that's what makes us unique mm-hmm. um so family traditions is really important just it, they can be really small absolutely so small i have i had worked with one family that they swore at each other like buggery and going in as a therapist you're like whoa what is this 
but that's actually how they communicated and Mm -hmm. when you and that's how they had fun it wasn't dysfunctional for them they weren't they weren't finding hardship or bullying or belittling in that I would find it if that came from my family member yep but it's what made them unique and Mm -hmm. you know it's what grounded them and drew them together this is what we do this is how we banter um so yeah it's really important that we have those like good tickets and we build up those good tickets so when we have to hit the hard stuff we're we're resilient to it we've we've got some good tickets in our backpack to sort of help us move through that that's that's really interesting I really love the idea of um pancake sundae yeah (laughs) Uh, so like you know um we have like the burger Saturday where we're sort of just um everyone's doing their own thing we know okay out of every other day we can do our own thing but Saturday night is like the night where we're sitting together and even just sitting in front of the TV while eating dinner and okay we have each each week we have like a certain person picks out the movie as well oh yeah That's our tradition being like okay there's a new movie on Netflix okay we have to all sit down and watch that and yeah you know to all a lot of um the people that I'm friends with, they're like, so you actually spend time with your family on a Saturday night? Like, I'm like, what? That's like, the, that's like the coolest part of the week, coolest day of the week where I was like, we're all we're all at home. We're all doing one thing and we all know where each other are. Like every other day of the week, I can go out. But Saturday night, all of my friends know that that's the night that I'm just with my family. We're just yeah. the four of us and all of us just having a good time and it's the way that it's always been um I think lockdown is where that took place or it started um just sort of having that time I mean everyone's at home but everyone's sort of at home in their own space yeah 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 so yeah yeah definitely definitely yeah so like there's many advantages to to doing those little family traditions um as well it's definitely something I teach in in my practice and work with families you know finding what makes you unique and and your family time unique and it doesn't have to be absolutely unique behaviors you know like watching a movie um eating dinner together things like that like there's a reason why nearly every family therapist you come across will suggest eat dinner at the dinner table first and foremost you know create a space for those chats I we personally don't we we sort of sit in front of the deli but you know that's that's what we like to do like we like to watch certain shows together so we will wait you know if my partner's away oh god forbid if I watched a telly show (laughs) that we're watching together without him you know like Grey's Anatomy oh can't go ahead but you know like we that's our thing and I think when you have those things that identify your relationship it's really important. It's really grounding. You know, this is what we do. Mm -hmm. Um, That sense of belonging is massive for families. You know, this is what we do as a family, even if it's a a once a year thing, you know, it might be every year at Christmas. This is what we do. This is, this is how we do it. You know, my, my partner's family or the in-laws do their breakfast thing, but every Christmas dinner is at Nan's house for all of them it's like it's like a non-negotiable unless you're heading overseas for a family thing yeah and you physically can't be there <laughs> it's a non-negotiable so on christmas day we're traveling four hours to bathurst to be there by dinner time you know it's 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 what you do um and that's what identifies them yeah and their their unique tradition for for christmas time so yeah i mean it's really important that we have things that ground us as families things that we identify with and things that we belong to um, and also, you know, things that build up those good tickets because, like I said, when we have more good tickets mm-hmm. um, or as Gottman would like to say, that positive sentiment override where we just have more positivity than negativity, then when the negative things happen, they're easier to deal with because they're going to happen. Let's just make them a little easier to, to move through. Mm-hmm. How... Well, we're talking about all the good things about having traditions. What are some challenges that take place when you have those traditions? Um, yeah, so you can definitely, I guess, fall into 
a bit of a mistake of having that dictator person who's going to dictate what the family traditions look like. And then so we aren't really actively participating, you know, we're sort of attending them. So it was really interesting before that, you know, you said that for your family tradition with Burger Night, everyone has a different role to play and they know their role within that. And so you have that active participation and that like I want to be here and we are doing this um, rather than someone just saying, this is our family tradition and this is what we're going to do. And then everyone sort of has to fall in line from that. And we were saying offline before about how, you know, sometimes culture can have a lot to do with that. Um, so family traditions in terms of culture and, and abiding by that can look very different to, you know, those cultural traditions, sorry, can look different to these are our nuanced family traditions. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes a bit of a mishap can be that we're falling into those cultural shoulds um rather than creating something that's uniquely us as a family as well um and then you know people grow out of them <laughs> like you know if you have this family tradition where you, you, with the young kids or something that you know every saturday night you put disney on you know i, I can guarantee when you know the kids get to 14 they're, they're probably well and truly over it <laughs> they want to do yep. something else so um, they do need to be quite malleable as well um, and, and flexible to meet the needs of everyone. Um, and sometimes what can happen is some family members will just hold on to what used to be and this is what we used to do as a family and instead of having those traditions move and keep up with the changes and the development in the family life cycle, <laughs> they're stuck way back when and so... They, they fade out, they cause conflict and things like that. I know, 100%. I definitely think that definitely impacts um, how valuable the parent, the functioning of the family is when, um, when it doesn't move with what is needed, what caters for yeah. the growing family that you have. Um, how would tradition impact parenting and your perception in life yeah I think um it definitely yeah just comes back to exactly what I just said about how parents can hold on to what was this is what we do and it's like hang on that's what we did and it hasn't quite adapted and kept up to what we're all doing now um I think in terms of how like in, in my parenting and how I'd like to incorporate that in my family is is exactly that like I'd like to find something that is uniquely us this is this is what we do um but knowing what I know is it's it's taking all my might not to dictate what we, <laughs> what that will be I think we, we would naturally find it um I think we can't force it we can't just sit down and my partner and I go, okay, what do, every Tuesday this is what we'll do this, as a family to keep us as a family. Like we, we're just naturally going to fall into something and that's what we'll we'll keep up with and prioritise for each other. Um, I think, you know, when when I grew up, we didn't, we didn't really have that. Um, but when, you know, with my, my dad and my stepmom and my brother and sister, you know, they have a lot of that and I'm incorporated heavily into that unit as well, even though they're, in Victoria and I'm in New South Wales, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, but that's what keeps us and our relationships alive. Um, and so I think, yeah, I, I definitely would like to find something, but the, my perception has changed in that that's absolutely important to, to any family is to find that thing that grounds mm -hmm. you and ties you together. No, I definitely think that's that's a big that plays a big role as to how a family does function. Um, so going into talking about some questions from audiences that we've received over the past week since we've advertised it, and I'll just focus on two that sort of haven't been answered throughout the podcast. Um, well, hopefully, I can answer them for you. <laughs> <laughs> if the flaw of a family function is rooted in culture that stem that the family stems from how can you approach resolving it wow what a big question <laughs> I, know. I got it and I was like um wow okay good luck <laughs> no okay so like 
I that that word flaw for me that's such a heavy word that's so heavy Mm -hmm. you know to say that there's a flaw in in cultural practices um and that so we're saying that cultural practices are impacting dysfunction in the family or directly causing dysfunction in the family um that's sort of how I'm interpreting yeah I think I think so I think that's how it is yeah so I guess um you know, as I, I guess I have to acknowledge, you know, my white backpack that I wear in answering this question as well. And in terms of, you know, coming from, from coming from that background and that lens, we don't have a lot of cultural practices that impact how our families should or should not interact and work and function. Um, and so, but what I do see a lot in my work, and we do work with a lot of um, Aboriginal families and cold families, um, the first thing that we do is is listen and hear that person out. So normally it's one person sort of really driving that cultural um, tradition and that cultural practice onto the rest of the family and there's normally a couple of people that are sort of trying to step away from that and go, that's old, this is new, no. Um, the first thing that we sort of do to, to alleviate that is to just ha- bring about that understanding and that compassion and empathy for one another and understanding where that's coming from, you know, that that cultural practice and tradition serves a purpose. Is that is that trying to gain connection? And if so, are there other ways that you might be able to gain connection that isn't putting everybody in the family offside? Mm-hmm. Um, but I think as a practitioner going in and talking to those families, you have to be really aware and just have that level of understanding and match to that family. If it is something that's really important to them, then we respect that we we aren't going to take it away from them that has grounded that person with their family unit for such a long time and that's why it's you know being driven really hard onto the rest of the family um and i think it's just again about that communication so who are we as especially again i wear my white backpack when i walk into these families so who am I to say that that cultural practice is wrong? Unless it's directly causing harm, then we would definitely say, "Hey, we need to <laughs> we need to look at this." But if it is yep. not causing harm and it's just a disagreement type thing, um, then who am I to say that that's wrong, right? Mm-hmm. And so what I would do is upskill the family with their communication skills to talk it out with each other, so they feel safe enough to go, "Hey, Grandma, I don't agree with that anymore." And how are we going to problem solve around this? How can I maintain <laughs> connection with you and maintain connection to culture without having to do this practice that I really don't want to do? Does that, <laughs> does that, do you reckon, does that make sense? <laughs> I th- it definitely does. I think it, def- it definitely has. Um, I mean, I grew up cultural because I grew up Muslim as well. So that's another aspect that's sort of, yeah. that's probably a, a big take on it for me. And that's sort of, I think, um, acknowledging that there's a cultural um reason for something for this being it and you know I think it's really important that there is that huge communication as to why why that culture sort of fits in with today's world and how it impacts today's world yeah 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 for sure so the next question is what is one behavioral approach to enhancing communication with family members that are convinced they are always right. Oh, yes. This is this is like this is okay. This is where ego comes into it, right? Like you know, I am right, you are wrong, or I am mum or dad, and you are child. So what I say goes, mm-hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so something. Oh gosh, there's so many that are sort of going, <laughs> trying to think of like, but the the main one is connect before you correct so what you're trying to do is go you are wrong i am right therefore i'm going to place my opinion on you and i'm probably going to be really loud and obnoxious about it and that's going to put you offside (laughs) um and now i'm just going to shut down anything that you bring to me because i am right and i will not hear it any other way um but you know there's nothing wrong with being wrong but a lot of the time it's that vulnerability um that that fear of being vulnerable to go yucky I was wrong that's really yucky for me and now I have to concede to you seen as a competition and so one 
the first one is building the good tickets with one another. You need a good foundation to sort of communicate from. There's there's no communication if you don't have, like there's no res- rules and respect if there's no love and warmth. We need to increase <laughs> love and warmth first. So if you've got that down set, you know, you've got some good tickets behind you as a foundation, then we can work on the rules and respect and communication. But I guess the, the tangible behind that, the connect before you correct is that level that, reflective statement you know i i'm saying this because i am right blah 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 blah. okay i'm hearing you i understand that this is mine or i understand that you must be feeling really angry about this labeling emotion disarm that person and then come in with your argument (laughs) still do it nicely you know we're not swearing we're not getting up in arms but we need we really need to disarm each other first um, so validating each other's experiences, reflecting back to people what you're hearing um, before you then go in with your your side of the argument as such. Um, and I guess where I went wrong again is that doesn't have to look like a lovely what we would call like I statement either. You'll see a lot of practitioners introducing these I statements. I don't use them very well myself. <laughs> um <laughs> they're quite robotic so it's you know when this happened I felt this way and it's it's very scripted and yucky but if all you can do is just validate that person first it completely disarms them and then you can go in with what you were going to say after that it doesn't have to be this big scripted moment um so classic example my partner does it really really well um and to the point where when it is scripted it just makes us laugh so if I'm saying so, he's an engineer, so he just wants to fix everything that I say. <laughs> um, it's very practically minded. So if I'm saying, oh, this is this is what was hard for me today and blah, 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 he comes back with, I understand that that must be hard for you. <laughs> <laughs> and straight away we just laugh and I'm like, oh, you're trying really hard. <laughs> you just can't. <laughs> And it completely disarms me. But if he is to come back with, why don't you just try this? And my way is the right way. Oh, my gosh. It is on like Donkey Kong. <laughs> we, we are at it. And I'm going to come back at him as to why it's not. And I'm right and you're wrong. But if he can disarm first, then I'm way more open. I'm like, okay, what are you going to say next? Like, what? what is this? I'm willing to take mm-hmm. it on. Um, so, yeah, connect before you correct with validation and reflective statements. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's that's a really good, and I think that definitely answers the um, the question in a way that is very positive. I think compared to just yelling, saying that I'm right, it's like the no, I'm right kind of argument. Because honestly, that gets nowhere. Like in my family, that is a constant thing that we deal with as well. No, I'm right. No, I'm right. I'm going to go slam the door now because you're not listening to what I have to say. <laughs> and you know what? That takes off energy and who has energy to do that all the time? <laughs> I know. And then you end up crying and then you're like, um, why? Why did I spend this last half hour? And then we end up laughing about it at the end. And it's just yeah. like, okay, yeah. well, here we go. <laughs> That's what happens. <laughs> <laughs> just just a little bit of validate, you know, yep, okay, maybe you're right, but I'm also right in, in yep. saying this and that's okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um okay so this is sort of a bonus question that I um that I usually ask every sort of um guest that I have on mm-hmm. what is the main thing you tell people to do who are going through some signs of family dysfunction oh okay that's really interesting because obviously that's what I see in my work every day. Uh-huh. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, so do you mean in terms of, you know, someone's venting to me, oh, this is really tough, this is what I'm going through type of thing? Or, um, Yeah, I think so. I think we can definitely look at it like that. Yeah. I think yep. I would like if just being there, Just I'm just going to sit in the shit with you for a second <laughs> and and listen and, you know, I'm going to listen to you. We actually, I actually don't really like to give advice as such. Um, I mean, in all of our training, we don't, we don't do that anyway. Um, but for me, I'm always curious about the bigger picture, like what's happening for everybody else. This is, yeah, this is your side of the story, but what's, what's, 
mum's side of the story or, or dad or, or brother or sister or whoever it might be mm-hmm. what else is happening you know what and then I'm also curious about what narrative you hold about that situation to what judgment you're bringing to it so you know I guess um I'm a little bit more critical and looking at the bigger picture um so I don't think like sorry to not really answer your question but we don't I don't, wouldn't really tell someone to do this or this um, mm-hmm. because the other thing is for some people leaning in is is what they really need they need to chat it out they need to vent to that family member and tell them what's going on other people are okay to walk away from that and not discuss it again and still be okay with it um, so it's not one size fits all it's really assessing the situation as it sort of comes but I guess I'd just yeah be more curious about what narratives are you bringing and why is that so hard for you and mm-hmm. what's everyone else's role to play and what's their narrative they're bringing to that too no that's a really good way to um that's a really good way of looking at it a really good way of sort of dealing with dealing with someone who you see is going through a little bit of trouble in in any kind of way as well i think that's a really good way to hold it um yeah, yeah. I want to thank you so much for coming on today and answering all these questions and helping us sort of define what family function or dysfunction is. And to sum it up, there is no, there is no clear answer. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know if I helped anyone there. I think I just maybe confused everyone more. (laughs) No, I think you definitely helped, especially when it comes to the, um, I really liked the traditions part that sort of plays a big role as an activity for family function. And yeah, that that definitely. And I know that this will definitely help a lot of people who are going through it. I'll I'll definitely push a lot of my friends to like have a listen to this <laughs> now and like listen how how it's defined. Um, yeah. So thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. You know, it's been really special to be able to come on and chat about something I'm so passionate about, and hopefully, yeah, someone can make sense of it all. <laughs> <laughs> No, don't worry. We'll have the um, we'll have the translation at the bottom of the screen. So, <laughs> yeah, Ashley means this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I want to thank everyone for listening today, and I hope that I, I mean, I know a lot of you have um, who are listening. It will definitely help a lot of you, and it's definitely helped me in understanding what family function and dysfunction is, and knowing the signs and all these other things. So yeah, if you want to hear more about it, definitely go and um, search for Ashley Chapman. Is there is there a way that people can contact you if they want to discuss this with you? Yeah, sure. Um, but probably the best one would be via um, my LinkedIn, which is, yeah, just Ashley Chapman on LinkedIn. You'll find me in there and you can chuck us a message through there. Yep, that sounds amazing. So yeah, if you need any, if you want to talk about this more with Ashley, definitely go and go to LinkedIn and yeah, just um, just message her. So yeah, thanks everyone for listening, and I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Right, I do have to go to the baby now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See you guys. Okay. Thank Bye. you. See ya. You've been listening to All Together, the Family Science Insights podcast, produced by Family Science Labs a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Lab. More episodes are available from 10 life management perspectives and can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and other podcasting apps available on your smartphone. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, share, and subscribe to our channel so that other people can find it and we can continue to provide quality content. More of our work can be found on our website at fa.lmsl.net where you can join our movement. I'm Dina Sargent and thanks for tuning in.